generally speaking, every trade negotiation is organized along a pyramid with three different levels. At the very bottom, you have the technical experts and they deal with really nitty-gritty stuff. Then you have the layer of the negotiators themselves and those are the people that, taking into account all that detail, work out the technical trade solutions. And then at the top, you have the political masters and the task of the political masters really is twofold. One is to ensure that there is a, a, a good trust and understanding among the different teams. They are the people who get on with the, with the other side and therefore they are also the people who work out any kind of problems that come up in the negotiation. They are the, the recourse of last resort. The business side of it should be interacting with each one of those three levels. So clearly the technical experts there is only so much that you can know within the administration, so they need to know from the businesses themselves what are the problems that they, they expect. Then the negotiators need to shape the negotiation according to the business interest of each of the, the parties and any good relationship there is it's very important also because, because of the timing of the negotiations. So you should prepare your interaction with the negotiator, let them know <laughs> what is what you really need, but it's very important that they know that they can come back to you if there is any specific problem and, and they do not really know what impact it is going to, to have on the key businesses of the, of the country. And then obviously at the political level it is crucial that the politicians at the top understand how important the negotiation is and what is exactly that you want to get out of it. I think it's very difficult to compare the Brexit process to any of the other bilateral negotiations that anybody handles, partly because we already know the, negotiation, the, the regulation on each other's side, because right now there are no um, borders, there are no boundaries, there are no tariffs, and therefore we start from a very different starting point. And, and a lot of the concern has been on the political side, so it is very difficult to compare this to, for example, the EU-South Korean agreement. Generally speaking, countries spend a lot of time understanding where each other is. We, we tend to call that the uh, photograph phase. We try to set a picture of this is how much we trade, these are the interests, etc. I think that in this case, frankly, it is done then each of the parties needs to understand where their interests are. And this is something that each of the parties need to work out for themselves. This is what I want, this is what I'm ready to give, this is what I could give but I would rather not, etc, etc. And then from that you go to the real negotiation where the parties, and I think in this case it's fair to assume that the European Union, because of its experience and also because of the relative weight in relation to the UK, they would be doing a lot of the, the drafting work. They put to each other positions and, and uh, articles of that agreement, negotiating agreement, on this is what we are going to open, this comes with this particular barrier, on this other area we are not going to, to have barriers. That is what you really negotiate at the different levels and you need to move it up and down <laughs> that pyramid. And then at the very end you agree on a text which needs to go to what we call ratification. I mean, that has been signed normally by what, a minister and a commissioner, and then it needs to go through the democratic process that the different parliaments, according to however it is organized in, in your country or international organization, uh, is required. So it takes quite a while. Not everybody is going to win, hopefully not everybody is going to lose, and you bring it to a middle point. From that point onwards, the technical work really starts at the trade level. So how do I translate this into an agreement? And is the trade drafting that, that basically encapsulates those objectives that you have? And it starts a real detailed process where I put a text to you, you disagree on whatever wording, you say, well, this is completely useless, I'm going to put something completely different on the table, I say, out of the question, <laughs> we are going to, to try to find a middle point until we come to the point 
that we are really disagreeing only about specific words within that agreement. But you are constantly going up and down that pyramid. That is the dynamic of the negotiation. Whenever we talk about going well, it is very important to understand that in the case of Brexit, unlike any other trade negotiation, what we are doing is to move away from a situation where we are very close to one where we are less close. You negotiate with people. This is not done by computers. And therefore, when you are in the negotiating room, you need to get on with the other side. You need not to be on the defensive. You need to trust each other. So somebody is coming to you with a position, you need to know that they are not playing games with you, that they are saying to you what they really mean and that they have the engagement of their business, of their political masters. And, and that is what has worried me in the, in the last few months, that there seems to be a lot of interest everywhere on blaming each other and escalating the rhetoric. And the, the best conditions for a negotiation is no rhetoric, just take it out of the room because if those people don't get on, it is very difficult to, to get the job done. Businesses need to do a combination of things. They need to understand very clearly what, is, what are their interests in the negotiation with the EU, but also in the negotiation with third countries. And everything needs to work together because if, for example, we want to offer agriculture to third countries, we are not going to be able to offer such an attractive package on agriculture to the European Union. So everything is interlinked. They need to understand what are their interests. I think that ideally they need to understand how this works in terms of the negotiations. So what kind of chapter for their particular sector they should ideally have at the end of the, the negotiations. And I think that it is also important that they look at their own red flags. So for some of them, it could be valuation for customs, things that they haven't really taken into account for trade with the European Union. For others, it may be accumulation of rules of origin. With others, that may be trading with Turkey. Like, well, what happens with Turkey now that we are not benefiting from the customs union? And in some of those issues that they may have, the solutions may be different. Some of the solutions may need to come through the negotiations. Some of the solutions may come through some of the restructuring of their supply chains. But all that homework needs to be done now because I think that otherwise they may be taken by surprise once the real negotiations start because they could go uh, much faster than they think in terms of influencing them. It is essential that every single business association or any business here in the UK that has a base or customers or suppliers in Europe is trying to tell those on the European side that there is a common interest and we need to try to make this a priority because unless both sides give sufficient priority to the negotiations, it's going to be very difficult to make real progress.